Welcome back to another part of Chat 2 with Ralph Sinensky and John Dayton. I hope you're enjoying these little special segments here as we talk about many things from the history of Hollywood and the history of the Waltons. So uh, maybe for some of the younger people, uh, here I am thinking that oh, seven. For me, the younger people is 90. <laughs> um, can you describe uh, um, you? Let's say, let's say do the Waltons where you, we had a kitchen scene. Now, explain the difference between a master, a close up, a medium shot, how that works. And did you shoot the master first? When I started, <laughs> the basic, and this goes back to the way they filmed many films in the 30s. You had a master which was to shoot the whole scene. Then you came in the closer end was like a two shot. Then you came into over shoulders. Then you came into close up. And that was just a format. And an awful lot of television in my time. And still, you shoot a, a master and then shoot a close up of everybody. Period. Mm -hmm. That's film. We talk about television. Television and film were shot on the same sound stages with the same cameras, with the same film that you went into it. And one is called movies and one is called television. They're absolutely the same. Except, that, except the difference between shooting with one camera and shooting with multiple cameras. Uh, uh, when, with multiple cameras on your soap, you can you switch live. You can see all the you can see what he's doing in his close up, and when you're on the master, you can you know hit a button and you don't hit the button. Well, yeah, but you know, it's going to so <laughs> that's a whole different field because I mean they, I mean they, they don't have the rehearsal time. They just come in, you know they. They, they don't have a rehearsal rehearsal period and then shoot it. They come in and sketch it in and then at the proper time, shoot it. But back in the 50s, there was a show called Matinee Theater. Are you, any of you aware? I, I, I know that, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm Albert old enough Cleary, to <laughs> Albert Cleary at Matinee Theater, I think it was on NBC. I think it, it, it aired at 12 o'clock. Uh, my friend Marlon Mason made several of them. They came in and they worked, and and these were done. These were done on tape. I know. Well, no, they were just live. Yeah, and, that's what I thought. And, yeah. and they came in. I go. They rehearsed two, maybe three days. I'm not sure. And then came in and shot the show live. Mm -hmm. And then that was a half hour show. But that you, you just did it. You know, poor Judy. <laughs> Hey, Judy, <laughs> we're well, kind of over here, aren't we? <laughs> no, no, this is great. I mean, and I want to make sure I get to what specific stories and things that you want to share, Ralph. But this is this is something I just know that I've been asked about. And sometimes it goes beyond my technical knowledge. So it's it's great to hear it from you who that's what you focused on for years and years and years, you know. Let, let, let me add this. Very early on in the 50s, I read something Mervyn Leroy said. If you want to be a director, start just look at film. And I did. Mm. And at that time, there were no, you know, you didn't have television. We didn't have tapes. You had movie theaters, but you had neighborhood theaters. Theaters opened at some theater, and then they went into the neighborhoods. And, you know, you went to the movies for 55, 65 cents. And if I went and saw a movie, and I also was taught early on, when you approach a project, when you approach a script, the first time you read it, you read it, just let yourself respond emotionally. And whatever the emotion is that you get, that's the emotion that you want to work for. And so I would go to a movie and watch it and just watch it to, to, to enjoy it. But I really got caught up and said, oh, boy, I, I really was involved in that. And I would go back and see it and sit and study it. Judy, the, the, the greatest place to learn about film are the films of the 30s and the 40s and into the 
the movies of that period. I mean, they are they are master classes in direction and in acting. Can I ask a question, Ro? Uh, no. <laughs> I'll see you later. <laughs> in regards to the producer and the director, in the cut, the final cut of the show, what we see, were there times when you had to make a decision as to how much, let's say, the master, how much of that, of the entire scene is just that master no, shot? No, no, I say no right now. But when I'm cutting the show, I'm cutting it as I, as I plan to film it. So, 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 so let's talk about one story, and I'm, I, I, if you could tell a little bit about this. I know because I was there. Um, at MGM, uh, you directed, uh, was it Paper Dolls, or was it uh, the scene? If it, was, if it was, we don't talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was a show that Aaron Spelling. It was huh? Aaron, Aaron Spelling's show. And you had a better a scene in the bedroom with, with uh, two actors. You had done it all in basically a master. And uh, then Aaron, evidently overnight, had seen, or in the dailies, had seen it, and he wanted coverage. So it, was oh, no, it, it wasn't it wasn't Aaron. It was Leonard Goldberg. Oh, okay. So to tell us about that. No, I refuse to talk about him. Okay, about Leonard. Well, the point was, I remember this so well. Um, you had to uh, reshoot the scene and yeah, and add close ups. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was set to do six, I did three and left. I shouldn't tell the story on Leonard, but as long as we've gone this far, my yeah. first show for Billy Goldberg was The Rookies. In, in those early days, I mean, I had a good cameraman, and uh, it, it was just a well-put-together show. Leonard took the show to the preview house. Now, that was a place on... Sunset, I think. Huh? I think it was on Sunset. On, set, uh, on at the corner of Sunset Boulevard. They would bring an audience in with new shows, show it. They, they had something in their hand. So that if they like something, it could go one way. And then afterward, they would select people from the audience, take them up into a room and have a discussion. When Leonard took the rookies that I did, and Bill Glenn told me this, he, he took that the preview house. They went through that, went up, had the discussion with all these people from nowhere commenting. And then they wrote all of that up. They brought it back. And then Leonard went into the editing room to change it to to according to what these people had, had suggested. And Bill, Bill Lynn said, and after he did that, then we had to go back and put it back again. I was going to say, yeah, um, that must, how do you feel as a director when somebody recuts your, your work? That didn't happen to me too often. It didn't happen to me too often. So I know in the Waltons uh, there we didn't uh, when it went to DVD. Uh, I, I don't think anybody knew or any of us were notified that it was going on DVD. And um, you know the the prints are uh, not really great, but when you did Star Trek, the original, and they. Redid it. Paramount redid it on DVD. Did you have any input, or were you surprised? Yeah. Once you left the show, once you left the show, you left it. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised that because I was surprised that um, was it Metamorphosis with the purple background? I remember that. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, they, yeah, they 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 did with Star Trek. They redid it. Some of it was done better there are many times where people prefer the original the original uh -huh. i mean there there is a a shot in start in the metamorphosis that i think is dynamite where we were shooting with nine millimeter 
so that but we had to put bricks around put stones around to kind of frame it because the nine millimeter was not only shooting off the top of the, the site, it was shooting the ceiling of the set yeah. at the sound stage. And so Jerry Fetterman had framed that and that was fine. Well Mark Mark the Okudas, Mark and Denise Okuda did they they did a rehash and you know, and redid some of that. And there was one shot when Glenn Corbett with the point of view of him coming. And it again was framed in that, but there they were able to take it away because it was just sky. There was nothing else. And it is a dynamite shot because I mean it really looks like you're on a, a full planet. I, I mean he, the figure is that small and this huge expanse of space. I show that shot when I talk about the show on my website. And I say, and it does prove though that it's what we could have done if we'd had more money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that raises an interesting question when you talk about like Star Trek and I know you worked on the original, which I know many people with our previous well, I'm, asked, I'm the asked about. I'm the director of the original series. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, I mean, when we look back to the period of time that we all predominantly worked in, the level of special effects, there was no digital, there was no, none of the computer graphics, there was none of that sort of thing available. And so you couldn't obviously look at a script that had special, what would have been by today's stand, oh, that's all just gonna be special effects. Those had to be created live in some way so you did uh, yeah i mean how what were some of the, uh, the magic uh, tricks <laughs> on that, well on that one jerry finnerman and i i made no bones of the fact that he he was he just was he was responsible for the look of star trek and uh, and what was his position he was director of photography okay he had been the cam he had been the assistant cameraman, camera operator for Harry Stradling, one of the giants mm -hmm. of motion pictures. And and I knew Jerry and I were great friends. And uh, he it came time for operate for, for operators to move into becoming directors of photography. And many of them did it younger. Uh, Jerry, see, Jerry, Jerry was ready, and uh, Star Trek came along, and Stradling was recommending him. And at the last, he signed for it, and at the last minute, got cold feet and tried to back out. And Herb Solo, who was the head of production for Desilu, said, "Jerry, if you back out now, you will never work in this town again." And so he stayed. <laughs> He was just magnificent. But on, on the Star Trek, we had this, we had one shot toward the astronaut's little house that he built. And then the shot away from it, which was just open expanse, and where our astronaut would go and stand. And it was just him. And Jerry had it lit. And then he said he wanted to put in a smoke. I wanted to put in a cloud. So we turned off all of the fans, closed the doors. He took the, the bee, the bee smoker, wafted some smoke above Glenn Corbett's head. But in meanwhile, everybody, uh, everybody on the crew had to stay absolutely still. And we had we had a cloud up there, and it's lovely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just did it. They just did it. Wasn't it Jerry Finneran that? that came up with the idea of saving money uh, on decor set decorations, et cetera. He would just light a wall with the color. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He, 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 the, the, the set was just gray walls. Jerry believed that the shot should also represent the emotion of the moment, of the people. Of the and he... 
he started coloring the walls and the network objected. Bio strongly objected. And then they objected to Gene Roddenberry and Gene Roddenberry stuck by Jerry. And I mean, and he did that to the end. And of course, the cameraman that followed him for half of the third season. If, if he, Al Francis, did, he maintained and tried to do it. Uh, not that he it just wasn't like Jerry, but when it went into other series and movies, and it, it just it did not happen anymore. And it's it one of the differences, and I think why the original series still survives. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, and it surprises me. That I did not know that NBC objected because oh yes, strongly. I, I would have thought they'd be excited because they yeah. saw Star Trek as a color show. I, I know, I know. You know they, well, don't don't put don't get me started on networking. Okay. <laughs> did that cast? Um, I mean, people ask us that about the Waltons, but that original cast what um what was the sense on that show about what they were creating and i mean obviously like the waltons it's got it's had this just incredible life and sometimes when you're filming things you have no idea or i've heard people talk alec guinness you know famously talking about doing star wars and and, and commenting that he was doing this silly little ridiculous film you know, and that the cast thought it would be nothing, and then it became, of course, one of the most, you know, well, I think popular. You know, Leonard, Bill, um, DeForest, the, the three men, they, they believed in Rockberry. I mean, mm. Rockberry had a vision. He was doing Wagon Train to the Stars, but he wanted to do a show about people, about, and about, about themes, about something. Not just entertainment, and uh, they 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 believed they believed it. I mean, because they, they were actors who were being given great great scripts and characters, great stories to tell, and great characterization to play. And they loved it. And yeah. the other thing was that you know Star Trek was never a success. It was canceled at mm. the end of the first season. And there was a writer, fan writer writing that put it back on the on, on the schedule. And there was the threat to cancel it at the end of the second season. I've heard a threat and I've heard that it was canceled. But whatever it was, again, because of the fan writing, it was put back on the schedule. And it was known. And part of this was Roddenberry. Roddenberry had a vision. He didn't buckle. Networks like to really determine what the shows would be and affected many shows because of that. And he would not he would not give in. And as a result, he was not a favorite at the networks. And once Lucy had to sell Desilu to Gulf Western, which owned already Paramount Studio, and had to sell it because she couldn't afford they couldn't afford to produce the show. I mean, it was that expensive. Plus, they were doing Mission Impossible the same year. I think that the two shows actually were adjoining sets, uh, or adjoining stages. At well, there, yeah, there were three There were three stages at the end of the lock. Two of them, one one was the Star Trek's main, the, 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 the ship. The other was their swing set and the other one was Mission Impossible. And Mission Impossible didn't need that much of a, a set because most of it was shot on location. I know I did one. Mm-hmm. I know. <laughs> it was the train, wasn't it the train one? Yes. That's what I thought. <laughs> I mean, that's fascinating to me that Desi Lu was the company that produced both of those shows. I mean yes. it, that that's a fascinating vision of oh, absolutely to well, have well, to they had, agree they had to great, that and, and they had a great they had a great head of television production for solo because he sold Star Trek to 
uh, in NBC and Mission Impossible to CBS the same year. In the following year, sold Mannix to CBS. So I mean, and then he went from there to Metro, where he sold uh, The Courts of Avetti's Father and a couple of other things at Metro too. He, he, he was he 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 was a, a fine executive producer. Herb Solo. Herb Solo. And that, I think he wrote a book. I, I know he wrote a book because I read it. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. He, he he and and then Robert Justman co-wrote yeah. a, about Star Trek. Thank you for joining me for this next part of Chat 2 with Ralph Zeninski and John Dayton. I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.